So my name is Joe and I am with the Riverside Medical Clinic Charitable Foundation. So we are a small but very mighty nonprofit located in Riverside, California, whose mission is to really improve the life and the health and the well-being of all of our local residents here, whether that's Riverside, Riverside County, San Bernardino County, or just SoCal in general. Um, so our foundation does that through various methods. So we do webinars such as this one on a regular basis where we have professionals come on and we do sort of health-based education. We also do health fairs. We had one a few months back. Um, we also provide support to endometriosis, um, support groups as well. That's another one that we host. And then we also have voting prevention and education that we do with our local schools and communities. Um, and so today for our webinar, we have Christina Ramos, who is a speech language pathologist, um, and she's going to be going ahead and talking about the role of the SLP when it's re in regards to dementia care. And with that, I will go ahead and give it away to Christina. Hi, good morning. Um, my name is Christina Ramos, um, like Joe introduced, and I'm going to be speaking about dementia and the SLP's role. I guess I want to preface this with, um, I'm going to give, like, I want to say, like, a summation of what an SLP's role looks like in dementia care um, for patients, because any of the topics that I'm actually bringing up, we can go into length about just in individually, um, because there's so much to be said about every topic um, that I'm going to be covering. So I really just kind of have a summation to give everybody an idea of what speech language pathologists um, do in regards um, to treating patients with dementia. Um, we're going to be answering basically the following questions, like what is dementia? What are the areas of communication that are impacted? And what's the speech language pathologist role? So that's what I hope that this presentation helps answer. Um, a little bit about me. Um, I am a licensed speech language pathologist. Uh, I graduated from Loma Linda University back in 2014 with my master's. Um, I am co-owner of Five Oak Speech Therapy Services uh, located in Grand Terrace, Redlands, Rancho Cucamonga, Murrieta, and Chula Vista. Um, we work with infants to adults. My career, I've worked with infants to adults with, com with various communication impairments. Um, my background before um, I was part of the private practice is in mainly in hospitals and outpatient care. Um, and so throughout my career as a speech language pathologist, I've really kind of delved in every population, um, but currently my focus has been the geriatric population. And as of recently, it's mentoring new speech language pathologists. Um, our clinic um, in Grand Harris, which is our main hub, our largest clinic, this is mainly where I'm housed. And I do take in a lot of students. I take in a lot of um, CFs. Um, and with that, because we host such a big population, I really have had to be a little bit of a generalist most of my career. But again, as of recently, my focus has been the ger geriatric population because it's really underserved, especially in the Latino communities. And being a bilingual SLP myself, um, this is really something that is kind of close to my heart. And so it's been something that I've been focusing on. Um, I'm also a mom of two girls. Um, they keep me very busy, um, but they're great sometimes. <laughs> um, on a side note, I enjoy baking. I listen to music. I drink a lot of coffee to keep up with my kids. Um, but that's me in a nutshell. So my first... Our first question is basically, what is dementia? And really, in, in the big scheme of it is, is, dementia is not the specific disease. Okay, so dementia is going to be the term that we use to describe the symptoms that affect one's memory, mental reasoning, their social skills. And these symptoms that affect these areas are, are severe enough that they're going to impact our loved ones, um, our patients' daily activities, daily lives. Okay, and so again, dementia is this umbrella term and under it, under it are gonna fall the diseases that lead to the symptoms of dementia. So a very well-known disease is gonna be Alzheimer's disease. This does count for the largest 
I want to say reason why we have dementia in patients. Alzheimer's disease does account for like 60 to 80 percent of patients who have dementia. And so because of that, it's very, very well, it's being very well researched and there's a lot of resources for it, actually. And so I'll be speaking about that as well. But also to give you a better idea, dementia can also be split in like three groups. So if you think about dementia, you can think in dementia of like primary, secondary, and reversible. So when you think about dementia as a primary, it's going to be dementia is the main source of the illness, right? So someone has Alzheimer's or Lewy body and these symptoms that are occurring from those diseases are these dementia symptoms. And so dementia is the primary diagnosis here. Um, secondary is going to be if a patient has more of a degenerative disease like Parkinson's, Hunting, uh, Huntington's disease. Um, Kutzfeldt Jacob is another one. Um, it's also known as subacute spongy form encephalopathy. Um, that's a mouthful. But basically, this is also a disease that leads to dementia. Progressive subnuclear palsy is another one that's not well known, but it does occur. Um, and it's, it's actually more prone to women. Um, and it leads to dementia. So again, the primary diagnosis is the Parkinson's, the Huntington's, um, and secondary, obviously, are the symptoms we're getting for dementia. And then there's that third group that can be categorized as reversible, which is patients who are going to have dementia-like symptoms, but they're caused by illnesses that can be reversed. So like a tumor. So a patient may present with dementia-like symptoms, symptoms because of a tumor. And once we are able to extract the tumor, then those symptoms actually get reversed, right? In many cases, um, medication side effects. So again, someone could be on medication that's causing dementia-like symptoms. And so if we adjust the medication, if we provide the correct medication then the patient stops having those dementia-like symptoms, this again can happen with infections or nutritional deficiencies. Um, which usually go in like the form of like vitam vitamins. If someone's missing like vitamin B, vitamin D in their system, sometimes they're going to have dementia-like symptoms. I mean, if it's in the severe realm. And so if we obviously have then the nutrition, the correct nutrition, the correct vitamins, the correct sources for that, then you're not going to see those dementia symptoms anymore, which is why we call that like the reversible group. So again, even with dementia, like I said, dementia is that umbrella term. So there are subtypes that cause this dementia, like Alzheimer's, um, vascular dementia. Mixed dementia is going to be any combination of the two of two other dementias. So many times you can have someone who has Alzheimer's disease and also has vascular um, issues, which are going to cause this dementia. And it obviously is going to look a little bit more severe for these patients because you have two two diseases that are impacting the patient's brain. Um, alcoholic dementia, um, you know, kind of pretty self-explanatory if we've had alcohol abuse. Um, and so this is gonna damage the brain. Huntington's disease, Parkinson's disease. Um, traumatic brain injury, with, with traumatic brain injury, what happens is we see this happening with um, athletes, um, who are in contact sports for having very frequent consecutive damage to the head. And so I know this has been a little bit more known in the past couple of years regarding um, football players and boxers, hockey players, that after several years in that sport, right, their brain develops or starts developing almost like a like its own protective layer and calcium buildup to try and protect itself. But so much hitting to the brain has caused, um, then causes damage to the brain. And so again, damage to the frontal lobe, to the parietal lobe is then causing those dementia-like symptoms. A lot of the TBIs um, that happen consecutively um, over a long period of time 
are then leading to Alzheimer's. Um, and so this is something that's I think newer for like the general population, but it's been studied for a while. Um, Lewy body dementia, frontotemporal dementia, um, again, newer kind of to the main public is like this um, progressive frontal progressive dementia, which again is happening with the gen degeneration of the frontal lobe, which is causing again those dementia like symptoms. Um, so with that, I'm going to talk a little bit about like science of dementia, because I think sometimes, um, at least in our practice and kind of what I do, um, I have, I get a lot of questions regarding like, when should I be worried and when should I not be worried? Um, so there are things that happen in normal aging. Okay. And then there's, there's things that happen that are more red flags than not. So when we think about like a memory loss, um, temporarily forgetting names or sometimes where you left your keys, that happening on occasion is a part of normal aging. So if we have um, a, someone who's in their late 60s, early 70s, and they temporarily forget a name or they happen to forget where they placed their, you know, their book, um, but then can recall it after a while, or that's only happened once or twice, this is not gonna be a major red flag. Um, now, if we have someone again in that age range who's having difficulty remembering familiar names, like of their kids, of their spouse, um, familiar places, um, or like recent important events, consistently, this is gonna trigger more of a red flag like mm, this doesn't look like typical aging this looks a little bit more severe um disorientation um sometimes forgetting the day of the week um i think when someone is under normal stress or someone's very busy um it's happened to me i go into the office and i'm like oh today's wednesday it's like nope just kidding today's tuesday um but I'm able to gather like, oh yeah, today's Tuesday. I was ahead, I was behind, right? That could be just normal. That happens, I think, to everybody at some point where we're really busy, stressed, um, get a little bit disoriented on your day, like, oh man, thought all this today was Friday. Um, again, happens on occasion, um, doesn't happen often. Um, but when we have someone who's getting lost on like their own street, um, forgetting where, how they got home. Um, these are more red flags um, that are gonna indicate, hmm, there's something here that's not, not looking like a normal progression. Um, challenged by mental task. Um, we all make mistakes. We might be calculating something, make a simple like mathematical error, happens on occasion. Again, part of normal aging, um, but unable to complete a task like following a normal recipe that maybe someone has been doing all their life and then forgetting steps, um, completely forgetting and unable to balance a checkbook, which I'm like, who uses checkbooks now? But people still use checkbooks. So that's an example. Um, daily activities, um, completing daily activities, normal in normal aging, you know, sometimes our parents or grandparents are gonna need help with their electronics, right? Like they're gonna need some just quick assistance, um, but we're not going to see our parents or grandparents necessarily need assistance in brushing their teeth or getting dressed or even just using their phone. So these are going to be, again, more red flags, especially when you have someone who's previously very independent and all of a sudden is losing these skills, um, maybe even at a faster rate than you'd expect. Um, in regards, again, more of a red flag, a possible indication of dementia is going to be difficulty, difficulty completing sentences, um, difficulty following directions, um, difficulty maintaining a conversation. Um, again, those are going to be more red flags. In judgment, again, normal aging, we're going to talk about mm, sometimes maybe if we... <laughs> 
lost our keys or we locked our keys in the car. Um, sometimes we make questionable decisions, right? In like our kind of fight or flight response, we might be like, oh, I need to break my window or something. And you're like, oh, maybe not the best um, option for that. I could have done something else. But I think in the heat of the moment, sometimes we make decisions. Um, but more of a red flag with our dementia patients are going to be really poor judgment, like getting into dangerous situations um, with even like handling items such as sharp, I like sharp items like knives or um, constantly even um, going into areas that they're not familiar with or areas that they shouldn't be in. Um, just constantly making kind of poor judgment calls where you're like, mm, this wasn't what, you know, my family member, or my patient was doing before. Um, probably the last one that happens, um, and not that it happens in this sequential manner, but one of the last things I think people tend to notice is sometimes the mood changes. Um, I think sometimes we have bad days, everyone can be irritable here and there. Um, but with dementia patients, what you're going to notice is sometimes withdrawal. Like they start withdrawing from family members, from social events, um, like increased suspicion about family members and people they know, disinterest. And so, again, these seem to me more red flags um, and signs of maybe even um, early onset dementia or like the beginning of dementia. So these are kind of more of the things to look out for. Now, as far as what areas are impacted um, with dementia, really it, it's, again, I'm giving like a more summation because everything's impacted with dementia. Um, obviously these areas, like I can go into them all at length, um, but in regards to communication um, and what SLPs are kind of helping and handling and helping patients and family um, family members with this, you know, memory um, coordination in regards to speech production and swallowing, um, language, um, reasoning. What you'll notice is I have um, emotions and behaviors in red, and this is because I think in addressing sometimes memory, the speech, language, and reasoning, we secondarily also um, kind of hit on emotions and behaviors um, because they're a big part of obviously our patient and patient care. And so sometimes patients will be frustrated, family members will be frustrated. And so in seeing patients in therapy, specifically in therapy, when we talk about reasoning um, skills and we work on reasoning skills, when we work on language skills, these happen to then impact the patient's emotions, the patient's behavior. Because by providing them with some tools and some tricks, we see an improvement sometimes in behavior and improvement in emotions. And so they're kind of areas we do hit, but they're not necessarily our primary areas, but they are areas that, again, we happen to touch upon because we're addressing the other, um, the other areas. Um, so the SLP's role, um, I'm gonna talk about the SLP's role in stages. Um, Cause I just felt like it was the easiest way to kind of address it um, in the amount of time we have to address it. Because again, I could definitely go into length of, in any of these areas. Um, and probably speak about those for an hour in themselves um, because there are so much there are, there is so much information there. But I think for the purpose of this kind of webinar, I wanted to talk about it in stages so you can see where an SLP lands in the scheme of dementia care. So many times um, when someone's having difficulty, a lot of people are going to go see their normal practitioner um, because someone's noticed an issue with memory or um, maybe language skills or like independence. And so they start going to go see uh, their practitioner or a neurologist 
to start the process of knowing if it's dementia, either caused by right Alzheimer's, Lewy body, or whatever else. Um, at this point, it's really actually really important to also bring in a speech language pathologist, which doesn't always happen. Um, but there's a reason why it's really important to see an SLP at this point. Um, and it's because of what we can provide in the initial stages. Um, one is through assessment, um, which I'm going to talk about in, in our next slide. Um, we help establish baselines in regards to memory, language, swallowing, um, establish a plan of care for the patient, and provide uh, family education. So when I talk about like assessment, it basically looks like being able to get a good current medical history and background for the patient, um, being able to understand what medications the patient's been taking, if there's a family history, the patient and the family's current concerns. It's really important to have this information in the beginning stages um, so we understand how progression um, then is going to go. Um, at this point, and um, a speech language pathologist can also perform a screen, like a screening tool um, that is going to give us even more indication about whether there is a high risk. Um, there is high risk for dementia Alzheimer's. Um, some screening tools that are kind of more well known um, for this population um, is the MOCA and the MMSE, which the MOCA, which is the Montreal. Um, I'm in a space, um, cognitive assessment. Um, this is a screener um, that you do have to be certified to give. And so you just have to find the right prov provider who is certified to give it. I will tell you most neurologists, I believe, and professionals dealing with patients who have dementia are gonna be certified to give this screener. The mini mental state examination is another um, screener, these, these screeners both are going to assess cognition. Um, and so it's going to assess cognition, a little bit of language, a memory, and they do it in a way that, you know, they've done lots of research with it, uh, but they do it in a way where it's really quick to give and it basically flags a patient who could be showing signs of early Alzheimer's or, or early, um, early dementia. So these screening tools are really important to give, especially early on, because if they are flagging a patient for dementia, then again, we could keep moving on through the process of getting the right providers and the right plan for the patient. Um, for speech language pathologists, again, we're gonna check the patient's receptive and expressive language. Um, at our practice, we typically change, we typically assess patients' um, language with the Western aphasia battery. Um, the way Western aphasia ba battery is going to check like patient's ability to follow directions, the patient's ability to name items, um, a patient's ability to complete sentences, to answer questions, some reasoning tasks, a little bit of orientation questions. Um, so it's gonna give us kind of an idea of where the patient's language is overall. And if there's any indication of anomalies in language or a decrease in language. So again, gives us a baseline of where this patient is and if there is outstanding issues in language where they are. Um, memory, we're also gonna, we're also gonna examine memory um, for speech language pathologists. Again, at our practice, I, really like to do the palm trees and pyramids um, exam. This is actually one of those batteries that is gonna check for semantic memory. So this is important with the dementia population because when I talk about semantic memory, semantic memory is basically can be known as like common knowledge, like more common knowledge memory, um, more stored in long-term memory. Um, and so we know and we see that a lot of patients with dementia start losing that connectivity between like that long-term memory and the association with words. And so 
I like doing the palm trees and pyramids test because it tells me where the patient's semantic memory is. So an example of that is if I were to show anybody a picture of like a duck and a bike, and then I were to show them a pond, nine out of 10 people, right, are gonna be able to tell me that the duck is associated with the pond. No one really, you know, teaches you that necessarily, right? You learn that through observation, through your life, you know, that you have all these associations, right? Because a duck swims, a duck lives, can live in a pond, right? Is by the pond, a duck goes in the pond. The bike doesn't go in the pond. But sometimes with our dementia patients, what we're seeing is they start losing that the association. And so they're gonna ding on, a, on an exam like the palm trees and pyramids test. Um, if I need to do more extensive memory testing, I we do the River Mead um, test at our site. Um, so this this re, this River Mead behavioral memory test is the more extensive, and it's going to really look at all of memory in regards to like short term memory, long term memory, working memory, semantic memory. It's going to be very extensive. So if I need to do that then we're doing more of that more extensive examination. Um, again, we also wanna check um, how a patient is swallowing, which is um, for us, you know, this dysphagia section. So if a patient um, is maybe at risk for dementia or there's signs of dementia, the patient and family wanna know they're coming in to get baselines, I wanna check the patient's swallow. So are they on a regular diet? Are they having any trouble swallowing? Are there any having any trouble eating, chewing? Are there any signs that they may be having trouble like coughing, watery eyes when they eat? Um, what does that look like? Because as, the, as it progresses, as dementia progresses, we start losing coordination. And so one of the main areas affected is gonna be the patient's swallow. Um, so again, I want to get a baseline of where's the patient's current diet and how are they eating. Um, in addition to all that, like all this clinical, um, a lot of SLPs, I think, that work with this population really deal with like family support and end of life care. So I always like to kind of ask families, like, do you guys have a plan for who the primary caregiver is going to be if the patient does have dementia or is diagnosed with Alzheimer's? And this is going to be something that, you know, they're all going to be dealing with. So who's going to be the main person, um, the main caregiver for the patient? Um, what does financial support look like? Do we, do, do we need to start reaching out to charities, to um, resources in the community to help the family? Um, Emotional support for the caregiver, um, having to take care of a loved one that has dementia is very, is very hard and can be very trying. And so we have to always consider the caregivers and allowing them to have support and providing support for them because it is a really big burden to carry, especially when you see your loved one. Um, start to have more of those symptoms and you start losing that person um, that you know. Um, a lot of people will tell you that they almost categorize it as a death in itself. And so it could be very, very hard. And although it's a very tough conversation to have, we need to have a manner in a safe place, in a safe place to have it. At this point, um, if the family does not have a geriatrician, I highly um, recommend the patient looking for a geriatrician to switch over care for their family member because a geriatrician is just gonna have a little bit of more of a knowledge base. Um, they're gonna be able to have, I think, better medication management. Um, and they also have a higher probability of being referred to other professions because that geriatrician has a more knowledge base on these kinds of these, these kinds of diseases that happen with the older population. And so again, at this time, if they're not with a geriatrician, I really recommend a geriatrician for the family. Um, really important topic, 
Two is end of life care. Um, it's really important that you have these conversations early on um, because you're not going to have an opportunity to have them once the disease has progressed. And so a living will, speaking to the patient about a living will, and this is going to include whether the patient wants to have two feedings, what pain management looks like, um, last will and testament, a living trust, um, letter of intent, like what does the patient want regarding funeral arrangements, um, like care for their pet, pets, um, where their documents are stored, their usernames and passwords. So they need to have this letter of intent now while they still have a good cognitive grasp and ability, rather than when we get to middle stages where then we've lost some of these skills. Um, establishing a financial power of attorney, um, healthcare power attorney, who's going to be making decisions for the patient when, when the time comes. Um, if the patient's already showing signs of early onset dementia caused by Alzheimer's or Lewy body, then at this point, this is why it's really good to have a geriatrician. A geriatrician is usually more familiar with this, is a letter of competency. So basically your doctor attesting that the patient has a mental capacity to do these legal documents and that way there's not dispute over these later. Uh, whether the patient wants to be an organ donor, um, DNI orders, and then finally HIPAA release. As you know, um, patient's medical history is private, um, but at some point the family or the main caregiver has to have access to the patient's medical records. And so there needs to be a HIPAA release done so that when the time comes, the family or caregiver can have access to the patient's medical information. Um, Again, not easy conversations, but they really do need to happen in the beginning stages uh, because when we have that cognitive decline, then these conversations can't at that point happen. For the mid stages, um, this is gonna be where I'm gonna talk a lot about like basically what therapy looks like. Um, therapy, development, um, develop compensatory strategies, um, home programs, monitoring, diet changes, family education. These are all the things that um, a speech language pathologist is doing during these mid stages of um, dementia care. So to speak a little bit more about that, um, I have it again, a little bit more broken down. And again, I could really speak about each one of these at length. And so I'm just gonna give a quick overview of kind of what that looks like. Um, so for memory, um, something that I think works really well with, um, dementia patients and has been kind of proven to work really well with, um, dementia patients is called space retrieval therapy. And this is to help patients again, recall, um, information right away. And so there's definitely a strategy and a madness and a, like a method to the madness, um, with it. But I think what the general population needs to know is that if, you're, if your loved one or your patient has um, dementia or some memory issues, ask about space retrieval therapy because it's known to be um, one of the better therapy approaches for patients with dementia or memory issues. Um, Space, speech therapists also use like Q hierarchies. Okay, so that could be in order to help a patient recall a target a term or a target event or a target response, right? We're gonna use a Q hierarchy, which would mean like I might provide the patient with um, like a category Q, which could be like if my target word for the patient to remember is apple, and the patient cannot remember apple, then I'm gonna ask the patient, I'm gonna tell the patient, okay, remember it's a fruit, right? So I've given the patient a category and I'm trying to have the patient pull from that to remember the word is apple. Or I might give the patient a cue like it's red and we eat it, right? So again, I'm giving the patient contextual cues to have the patient try and recall that target word. I might provide multiple choices. So again, okay, was the target word banana, foot, or apple? And out of those three, I'm hoping the patient can, again, that could trigger the patient's memory so they could remember the target word. Um, memory books, um, at this point, we like to establish memory books for the patient. Um, 
they're really important. Like you can put important dates in them, family members, other important items of, that the patient kind of holds dear, put them in that memory book so the patient has that to refer back to. Um, home videos, um, watching home videos. Um, it'll build support um, in the home, it can aid in long-term memory. Um, we can use it if the patient appears to enjoy the activity. Um, both the therapist and the family member can ask questions. We can ask the patient to repeat information they just saw, allow, but we always wanna allow the patient time to respond. So that we're gonna have to keep in mind throughout this whole time. As far as um, language, speech, and reasoning, um, a lot of the activities we do are gonna be kind of matching and sorting activities um, to help the patient with naming, with categorization, um, with associations, again, to keep that language um, going as much as we can, um, maybe even visual prompting. Um, so if we need them to name a target word or we need them to come up with a sequence, we might provide visuals that help the patient do that. Um, sentence completion, um, which is gonna look like the grass is, and we wanna trigger that word green, right? And so we're gonna create these sentences with kind of a known ending. So the patient can, again, give us that target response to kind of keep language and speech going. Um, another type of therapy that's very popular um, and kind of known is that melodic intonation therapy. We use this a lot when patients start losing their fluency. So they start being, having those sentences and having um, that struck that sentence structure or they start losing like the words and so we trigger creating sentences and recalling target words or words like verbal naming through um, melody and so that could be like tapping including music um, again there's a whole method to melodic intonation therapy I think a lot of speech therapists sometimes use bits bit, bits and pieces of everything um, in order to tailor, spe tailor it specific for the patient. And so keep that in mind. At some point, you know, just as I was talking about earlier, um, coordination becomes an issue. And so coordination is gonna impact our actual ability to produce um, the sounds, the words. Um, and so we have to start teaching our patients about maybe over articulating so that the words come out clearer, maybe increasing their volume, slowing their rate. Again, these are all things we're doing in therapy to help the patient continue to be as commun communicative as they can be. Um, dysphagia, um, you know, when it deals with the patient's swallow by mid stages, again, due to that coordination issue that could happen with patients with dementia we're gonna see maybe issues swallowing. So you're gonna see more coughing, maybe bouts of choking um, during feeding. And so at this point, you're gonna have the SLP maybe recommend a modification to ensure that the patient can have safe swallowing. So that could look like changing their diet from them having regular foods and regular drinks to thickening the liquids a little bit to maybe chopping up the food um, so that the patient has an easier time swallowing. Um, we could also start introducing exercises um, at this point for the patients, um, like teaching them how to do a hard swallow, teaching them the shaker exercise, which is basically an isometric exercise, where they're tilting their head back and forth um, in order to um, kind of strengthen those muscles as best they can. Um, and again, kind of incorporating those exercises in therapy to help the patient with their swallow. Um, compensatory strategies could include teaching the patient how to tilt their head when swallowing to ensure swallow safety, alternating between liquids and solids um, in order to, again, ensure swallow safety, um, teaching them a lingual sweep, which would mean that sometimes they, a patient could pocket food in their cheeks um, beside their molars. And so teaching them to go in with their tongue and sweep their mouth to make sure they don't have residue and they're not choking on that later. Um, 
environmental changes, um, limiting destructions when a patient eats, um, even changing the cups or the plates at some point because they need to be non-slip, the patient needs to have a better grasp, um, providing a meal schedule, reminders for patients, because at this point we might have our patients start to forget to eat. They forget to, that they're hungry. They forget that they need to eat. And so establishing, again, meal schedules, reminders so the patient makes sure they, that they go and eat. Um, these all happen again in kind of those mid stages of dementia. And it all looks different depending on the patient, depending on the family dynamic, but I think this is kind of a summation of what it could entail. Um, for the final stages um, in regards to dementia, again, a speech language pathologist are really gonna be there for family education, diet modifications, strategies for the family, and ensuring best quality of life for the patient, you know, when it comes to those areas. Um, these are, again, really hard conversations to have. Um, by all means, it never gets easy and it's never the same. And so in addition to everything kind of we've covered, I also want to mention, you know, being kind of like culturally aware. At, for us in our clinic, we deal with so many different um, ethnicities, cultural backgrounds. And so we all have to be mindful to be as educated as we can be regarding everyone's um, cultural preferences, um, again, their backgrounds, um, and things that happen in their family when these stages come. And so you have to be aware of those and you have to be sensitive to those. Because I think sometimes people get very clinical and we get very like, oh, this and this and this needs to get done. But we have to be aware that everyone has their own way of dealing with, you know, a loved one in the late stages of dementia who could be at this point in palliative care or hospice. And with all that and kind of looking at the patient as a whole, you have to be sensitive about where the family is regarding kind of their loved one and dementia. So I want to mention that, you know, because some of these are very kind of like bulleted and I'm like, oh, this and this is what we can do. But sometimes we have session where we're just kind of a support and a lending ear because they just need to talk because they're frustrated. Um, and because our patients at this point are going to start getting frustrated um, that they're not as independent as they used to be. Um, that sometimes they have sufficient language, but they don't have the memory. Sometimes the memory is still kind of there, but they're starting to lose their language and coordination. So please know that a lot of frustration happens during these therapy sessions. And so sometimes therapy session doesn't look like that. Sometimes therapy session looks like we're listening and we're gonna do something successful. I wanna do something successful that the, I know the patient can be successful in because I want the patient to feel to have a good quality of life and leave my office feeling successful. Um, in regards to memory, um, again, for the final stages, um, at this point, we're really kind of talking to the family caregiver about environmental adjustments. Um, this is kind of the point where sometimes we start losing our um, loved ones and not, I mean, like losing, like as in passing, I mean, losing, like they start wandering. Um, and so I tell family members, make sure that the doors are locked, that you have secondary locks on doors, that you have like some kind of ability to track your loved one, you know, in case that they do wander off. Um, so environmental changes so that the family member isn't getting lost. Um, memory books, again, we're still utilizing that memory book to help the patient, maybe sometimes we call family members or try to remember patients, um, family members' names, um, just to even have small conversations. Um, a big thing during this stage is redirection. Um, and this is gonna happen throughout like the language reasoning as well. But at this point, you might have the patient, or, you know, your loved one with dementia start repeating themselves a lot. Um, maybe even um, speaking about um, events that 
didn't happen, have happened a long time ago, um, unrelated to like the time and place. Um, and so I really talk to families about continue the conversation with the with you know your loved one or the patient with dementia as reasonably as you can. So you might have a loved one or your patient tell you like that they just you know, they got to your office, you know, they drove independently and they stopped at the market and picked up groceries and now they're here and they need to get back home to cook dinner. And you know that that is not what happened. And so I think instead of going, no, you didn't do that. No, that's not real. You know, that leads a lot to kind of like, I want to say arguments or kind of frustration on both sides. Because you're going to have the family member who's going to be like, no, but you didn't do that. And the patient who's going to be like, no, but yes, I did. And again, frustration ensues. So I try to teach the family members, continue with that conversation as reasonable as you can. It's like, oh, you did drive. Where did, what market did you go to? You're going to see that not only is this going to trigger them to communicate more and use that beautiful language that they may still have, but it's going to decrease frustration in both parties. Now, I also have patients who are going to tell me like, oh, I need to get my keys because I need to drive to pick up my medication. And you're like, no, this patient doesn't drive anymore. You know, same with family members are like, no, you know, mom doesn't drive anymore. Like I can't let her drive the car. So again, redirection, something that I teach the family members is redirect. So if they're really adamant about they need to drive to the pharmacy to get their medication, I'll redirect with going, okay, why don't we look for your car keys? Do you remember where you put your car keys? And, you know, and with that, like, we'll start looking for car keys. And then I'll say, oh, did you find your book? Because I, you know, you said you wanted to read. And they're like, oh, yes, my book. I can usually redirect the situation in that manner so that they don't get stuck on that finding the keys to go drive, right? And so teaching redirection strategies to family members, again, to decrease that frustration in those later stages. Um, This again is gonna happen in language, speech and reasoning, okay? Um, Teaching that redirection, um, using compensatory strategies like picture books. Um, So if a patient needs, maybe is wanting a cup or a patient is wanting like their book or a patient is wanting the TV on, At this point, maybe they don't have, they can't recall the words um, as quickly or as often anymore. And so providing the patient with picture boards of like common items that they usually need could help the patient as they can use gestures pointing to show their caregiver or even their clinician what it is that they need or they'd like to work on. Um, And uh, adjusting, um, again, Um, The house to ensure safety um, is important. Um, At this point, we like to do visual schedules to remind the patient, like when they wake up, they have a visual schedule, which will look like pictures in a sequential manner of like what to do first. So when you get up, right, you go to the bathroom, then you brush your teeth, um, you get dressed, um, you go to the kitchen, you eat breakfast. So developing, developing visual schedules to help the patient with the activities of daily living. Um, always allow for the patient to have like a time to respond. Um, sometimes we ask questions and we are very kind of go, go, go and we're waiting for a response. With our patients with dementia, you have to remember it's gonna take them some time. And so allowing time for response is always going to, is it should, it should help with decreasing frustration. Um, with dysphagia, this is what we're going to talk about again, modifying the diet. Maybe now they need purees um, and um, like honey thickened liquids, or maybe at this point they're not safe to swallow anymore. So we're going to refer back to what were the patient's wishes that they want to get a feeding tube, that they not want to get a feeding tube that they wanna continue eating, knowing the risks that maybe eating um, and having not a great swallow could lead to pneumonia, right? So that's why those conversations need to happen in that beginning stage. Because at this point we're modifying the diet or we're referring them to the appropriate providers like a GI nutritionist, dietitian, so that we make sure that they're getting what they need. And as far as, again, nutrition, 
uh, but also if they're not safe to eat, are they going to get a PEG tube, um, a J tube, whatever the case is to be able to eat. And maybe we're only feeding them a couple meals throughout the day just for like oral gratification. So maybe they get like some jello, some mashed potatoes once or twice a day, just so they can have something like that they feel good about eating. But a lot of their nutrition is coming from a feeding tube. But the patient could maybe have not wanted a feeding tube and she wants to, or he wants to continue eating, knowing the risk that it could lead to pneumonia. Um, again, compensatory strategies. Um, and this is going to look like, again, making sure that the patient is upright when eating, maybe doing a head tilt, um, limiting distractions to continue to have that during the stages for the patient to eat. Um, So with all that heavy information, I feel like um, there are some things that I think we can all do to, I, I can't even say really prevention, prevention, but, you know, there are things that put us at higher risk um, for having dementia. Um, and if you smoke, quit smoking. Um, if you have any cardiovascular risk, make sure you have those managed, right? Um, so, you know, like high blood pressure, cholesterol, make sure you're taking care of those health conditions because these can lead to blockages, vascular blockages that could lead to dementia, um, treating health conditions like diabetes, um, treating hearing problems. Um, we know that any patients who have hearing, um, again, hearing issues, hearing problems, tend to have faster cognitive decline, which then leads to those dementia-like symptoms. And so if you have hearing issues and health conditions, um, make sure you're treating those, okay? Because these could, these are things that put us at risk for dementia. And in treating these, we can maybe prevent those dementia-like symptoms. Um, try to keep a good diet and exercise keep your mind active, stay socially active. This is actually super important um, and get good quality sleep. Like all the things that we should all be doing that we probably don't all do all the time, but they are things that put us, at, if we're doing, if we're not doing these things, they put us at higher risk for having uh, those dementia-like symptoms. Um, there are resources. Um, these are like probably my, top resources that I give out um, for patients. Oh, well, cause it also depends on kind of your location, but ARP is a big one. Um, the Alzheimer's and Related Dementia Education Referral Center. Um, AngelSense is really cool. They actually like help track your, um, your family member or your, your patient, like in case they wander off. Um, so they're like a, they're like an app thing that helps you kind of keep track of your loved one. Um, benefits checkup. Um, I offer this to everybody. Um, this website helps you see what benefits are available um, for the patient. And so that if they need financial support, they need assistance, this is a great way to kind of get that started. Um, caregiver, action work, caregiver Action Network. Again, this is really great for the caregivers so that they have support and they have kind of somewhere to go. Um, all the links for these are actually located on that seniorlifestyle.com. So you can go to that website and they have all these links, like all there ready to go. So it kind of helps with that. Um, and in a nutshell, that's it. That, that's what I have for like dementia and SLP's rule. I hope that this has been helpful. I hope that you were able to take um, even like one bit of new information from uh, like my presentation. Um, I've actually really enjoyed doing it. Um, and if you guys have any questions, I'll let Joe figure out how to do that. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, thank you very much, Christina, for joining us for the hour in the morning. And yeah, if anyone has any questions, you can either utilize the Q&A feature or you can utilize the chat feature, whichever one you feel most comfortable with. Um, and then we'll go ahead and answer them if you have any. But Christina will answer them rather. I will not. <laughs> um, I guess um, there is one thing that I was curious about too. It's kind of like um, 
What do you think is like the most common barriers to communication that you come across in your practice with patients and family members? Like if you had to pick your top three most common presenting barriers, like what would what are those that you would sort of have to pick? It's gonna be like on a clinical sense, it's gonna be the naming. Um, patients have struggle with naming. Um, so it starts showing them objects, even daily, like their daily using option, ob objects, and they'll start losing the name of it, right? Which is then triggered, related to that semantic memory. Um, the other one is like word fluency. So what words fluency is, is if I give someone a target, let's say a target letter. So target letter S, and I tell you, I need you to tell me as many words to start with the letter S in one minute. Again, being able to use that flexibility and at working under stress to pull those um, target words that start with the letter S, they struggle. We struggle with that a lot. That's something we work on consistently with our patients with dementia and sequ like sequencing of events. So again, in communication, when you tell a story, even when you have a conversation, you're telling about your day routine, things, you're going to have a sequence to how you tell something, right? So if you're going to tell somebody about a concert you went to, you're not going to start with like, oh, we left at eight, right? We typically start with, oh, I got to the concert about, you know, seven. We did find parking. Um, it was really nice. So you're going to speak about it in a sequential manner. And our patients with dementia start losing the ability to do that. And so that's a very big communication barrier because then conversation starts to become conversation becomes difficult to maintain because then your communicative partner can't follow your conversation. So those are probably the top three. Are there like any tools that someone at home like a caregiver could sort of utilize with their loved one um, if maybe they don't have access to an SLP readily or um, if maybe if they're underinsured and they don't even um, they won't be able to get those services? Okay, so a Five Oaks plug, even if you're not insured, I will see you. We do have like an angel program here. And so if you're not able to, if you don't have insurance or you can't afford the therapy sessions, we do have sponsors that help patients uh, with therapy. So plug, we will still see you. And even if I don't have that, I will figure out a way to see you, especially if you need the services. But something that family members can do is that starting of that memory book. Um, because being able to try, kind of start tracking what the patient is starting to maybe forget and wants to remember is really important for just quality of life. And it really helps decrease frustration. Um, again, the other thing that's really important to start keeping and trying to do in the earlier stages or if they don't have access to is like visual schedules. And anybody can do that. You can go in and you get pictures or like if you have, if you have the ability to print somewhere, you can print what the patient's day looks like, right? So today we're going to like wake up, we have a dentist appointment, and then we're going to come back and have lunch. And then, you know, um, the grandkids are going to get here, you know, so that way the patient feels prepared for the day. Um, because again, if they're starting to lose the, like forget, start to be forgetful and start to lose some of their language. Um, frustration happens because they become or disoriented in the day. So all of a sudden 10 a.m. comes and it's like, okay, we're going to the dentist. The patient's not prepared for that. Now the patient doesn't know where they are, doesn't know where they're going, has become disoriented and can become frustrated. So again, keeping schedules and reminders for patients. Um, this is something that loved ones can do at home that could decrease the frustration and that could help the patient start to then rely on those methods to feel safe. Perfect. Sure. That's, that's some great tools. Um, Thanks. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> not only they are. I mean, um, I mean, our fields are somewhat related in the sense that like, I, I'm much more on the dietary portion of it. So, you know, when you were talking about uh, spit and swallow tests, brought back a lot of memories of patients that I've worked with in the past. Um, it's always difficult with diets um, because people just forget to eat, unfortunately. Yes. And so we see the weight loss, right? We see the weight loss and really quick deterioration because obviously nutrition is so important. So I always try to include the nutritionist or dietitian as soon as we start seeing swallowing issues, because we need to increase that caloric intake um, because it's also really good for the brain, right? The brain needs food too. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, 
Right. Does anyone um, have any questions or any comments um, before we go ahead and end the webinar? Thank you go ahead and type them in the chat. Um, if not, if you think of something later, totally fine. Um, once we go ahead and end the webinar, this will be posted on our YouTube channel. Um, and then you'll have access to information as far as like how to contact Christina, how to get in touch with um, Scott Oak Therapy Speech Services. So that way, if you have any questions that are more clinical in nature or anything about a loved one, how to sort of get them connected to services, you'll be able to do that. Um, all right, so with that being said, thank you so much, Christina, for taking the hour of your day to go ahead and join us on this webinar. Um, and thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> No, thanks for having me, Joe. I really like enjoyed it. And again, I just hope that we, there were some takeaways from this. Um, this is my um, my first caveat of doing like webinars, and I think it was pretty fun. So I I could do another one. I think maybe. <laughs> Great. I mean, yeah. If you're if you're willing, we will definitely have you. We can even do a, a deeper dive into something specific. No, thanks so much, and I hope you have a great day. Thank you. You too. All right. Goodbye, everyone.